Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a minute here as more people come into the room. My name is Axi Navis. I'm the director of the Outdoor Recreation Division, and we want to welcome you to this first of a new speaker series that we're launching today called Dispatches from New Mexico. And really, the goal with this seminar is to showcase all of the amazing resources we have here in New Mexico and beyond and hopefully educate you all, our listeners, people who, who love to get outside of New Mexico's lands and waters, how to do that in a more fun way, in a safer way, and in a more responsible way. So I want to start um, with that, that setup. I can also point you to our website, nmoutside.com, and that's where a full calendar of these events is going to be posted in the short-term future. So check that out. Again, the URL is nmoutside.com. I'm going to start with some intros, but first I want to recognize um, the indigenous leaders in New Mexico and want to start with the land acknowledgement, which I think is especially relevant today, given the topic of conversation, since many of the lands and waters we'll be talking about here in the next hour and then in the series as a whole are unceded territory of indigenous people in New Mexico. And now since we're located all throughout the state, and really the country for this, I'll recognize where I am based currently, and I would ask folks to do the same in the chat to the right um, of your screen. So I live, work, and recreate on occupied indigenous land of the Pueblo and Hickoria Apache peoples, and while understanding that state and county borders and the concept of private property that they delineate is really a colonial construction, I acknowledge this land that we call Taos County today is occupied territory of the Pueblo people. Taos Pueblo is located about 10 miles from where I sit now. And just this week, the Pueblo celebrated the 50th anniversary of the return of Blue Lake. This legislation marked the culmination of decades of activism to restore those lands to the Pueblo. And as a representative of state government and sitting in this chair at the Outdoor Recreation Division, I am so grateful to learn from and be inspired by the Pueblo's committed stewardship of this place. So I and the office stand in solidarity with indigenous people's movements, and I commit the office to supporting indigenous-led solutions, land management practices, businesses, and organizations in the state. To me, that includes recognizing with and grappling with the very real impact outdoor recreationists can have on Pueblo land. And to that end, the Outdoor Recreation Division is committed to constantly evaluating its role in growing the outdoor economy in New Mexico, in a way that takes its lead from the Pueblos as original stewards of these places. So I invite you to do your own land acknowledgement in the chat based on where you are. I'd also ask that you include the name of an indigenous leader in New Mexico or beyond, authors, business owners, politicians, teachers, chefs, parents uh, who have inspired you. So thank you. Now I wanna hold space for that thought as we get into the subject for this session today. I think this topic can have a direct impact on, on Taos Pueblo and the surrounding Taos community and then beyond throughout New Mexico. So we're here talking about backcountry skiing and snowboarding as some of the fastest growing winter sports both in the country and in the state. And as more recreationists enter big mountain terrain every season, I think it's imperative that they're equipped with the right knowledge and decision-making skills to keep themselves and their fellow skiers and riders safe. So this seminar is a good place to start and we are joined by some truly incredible people, but it is by no means enough. The goal after today is to give listeners a sense of the resources we have available here in New Mexico to learn more about this topic and continue digging into the research. So today's event is co-sponsored by UNM's International Mountain Medicine Center, the Taos Avalanche Center and the Silverton Avalanche School. And with that, I wanna introduce our amazing panelists who are here this morning. Dr. Aaron Riley. So Dr. Riley is an emergency physician and core faculty at the UNM International Mountain Medicine Center with a specific focus in both ultra endurance racing and avalanche rescue. He serves as the medical director for several ultra marathon races and is on the board of directors for the Silverton Avalanche School. Daryl Macias is the, is the professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine um, and the director of the UNM Wilderness Austere and International Medicine Fellowship. He's the medical director of the IMMC, and he is a medical advisor for the Kumbu Climbing Center in the Everest region of Nepal. He's been the physician to K2 and other peaks in the Himalayas. 
and he also started all of the wilderness medicine programs at UNM and currently teaches Abbey education worldwide. Thank you both for joining us, doctors. Tao's Avalanche Pleasure. Center, we are joined by Andy Bond. So Andy grew up in Massachusetts before heading west to attend college. His passion for skiing and climbing kept him here. And in 2008, he started guiding with RMI Expeditions. Andy guided several routes on Mount Rainier and has climbed and skied several more, as well as guiding trips on Denali. He took a hiatus for a few years to focus on ski patrolling and developing a GIS application for avalanche mapping. This led him to found the Taos Avalanche Center, where he's, he is the executive director and forecaster. Really glad to have him here today. Dr. Len Nessifer is also joining us. He is the founder of Natives Outdoors, an outdoor gear company that works with indigenous artists and athletes to create gear that supports outdoor recreation on tribal lands. He's a member of Navajo Nation, and he holds a doctorate from Carnegie Mellon University's Department of Engineering and Public Policy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Nessifer. Also a backcountry so, skier as well. And a, and a backcountry skier. And we're excited to hear more about his experience and, and the work you've been doing. Last but not least, Silverton Avalanche School, joined by two representatives. Jim Donovan uh, is the executive director. He is an emergency manager, avalanche specialist, mountain rescue specialist, and avid backcountry skier. We're also joined by Aaron Rice. Aaron lives in Santa Fe, where he balances his snow-filled winters by farming in the summers. As a snow pro, Aaron takes a versatile approach, simultaneously working as a professional ski patroller at Ski Santa Fe, a field technician for the NASA Snow X campaign, a field observer for the Taos Avalanche Center, and now a rec instructor for the Silverton Avalanche School. So I'm gonna hand it off to Aaron and Daryl first at UNM to start the seminar. I hope you, everyone listening today sees what a wealth of knowledge has, has come to join us this morning. I'm really excited about it. Honored to have this brain trust here today to present on backcountry skiing in New Mexico. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And we will try to leave questions in the final 10 minutes of the hour. So just drop those in the chat as they come to you. And with Thanks, that, I'm gonna share this presentation. Thanks, Axie. I appreciate that and uh, for setting this up and uh, for inviting us to be uh, participants. And so, um, uh, just as I said, so I'm Aaron Riley and I'm here with Daryl Macias. We're emergency physicians and wilderness educators at the University of New Mexico, uh, specifically the International Mountain Medicine Center. Um, we've been doing wilderness education in New Mexico for quite some time. Uh, myself, only about six, seven years, but Daryl's been here for over two decades and has kind of spearheaded a lot of the wilderness education, um, both regionally and nationally and internationally. And so um, great, to, they're great to have him here as well. Um, obviously, the point of this is to kind of give an introduction or uh, let folks know what resources are available um, for recreating safely in the backcountry in the, in the, in the winter, um, because there are a lot of hazards and a lot of danger and information is, uh, is important, knowledge is important. And we're going to hear, obviously, from the Taos Avalanche Center, which has been a great resource in the Silverton Avalanche School, which has been well established for a long time. And they have some great programs on weather forecasting on specific, uh, you know, digging pits, assessing snowpack. Um, even up to if, um, unfortunately, somebody is involved in an avalanche to rescue um, that person from the avalanche or get them unburied from the avalanche um, as efficiently as possible. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the formal training programs that are available in avalanche education then stop there. Um, and once you kind of have got to the point where you've unburied the avalanche victim, you know, the steps to partake, uh, to, to take next are often uh, not part of any type of education program. And so uh, you know, that is extremely important in making sure that we have the best outcome because, you know, obviously, number one is prevention, trying to educate yourself to try and stay out of avalanche terrain as much as possible, to travel safely in the terrain. Um, but sometimes, despite best, uh, best efforts and uh, despite the fact that you think you're making all the right decisions, people get buried. Um, and so, you know, once you get them unburied, knowing the next important steps are really, really important. Um, part of that is, you know, do you know how to uh, uh, get to the head first? Do you know how to assess an airway? Do you know how to clear an airway? Do you know what kills people in avalanche terrain, like um, suffocation, trauma, hypothermia? And so I'm going to hand it over to, to Daryl now. And what he's going to do, he's been working with an um, uh, organization called Mountain Safety that has developed this uh, a couple of different algorithms, but uh, uh, to 
kind of help people to know what kind of steps to take if somebody is buried in an avalanche and how to assess a patient. And so go ahead, Daryl, um, uh, take over. Great, thanks a lot. So you can all see the slide there. This uh, picture right here is us teaching one of our avalanche resuscitation courses at uh, last year, or I guess it was still this year's Wilderness uh, Medical Society uh, Winter Conference in Idaho. And just to make sure, a lot of us are probably fairly savvy with regard to, you know, what to do in case of an avalanche. Initially, we know how to unbury people, hopefully, and some of us may not. That's okay. So, you know, you can get your uh, avalanche courses underway. Talk to Jim after this. But one of the vagaries that I think Aaron and I have talked about is that often, once we have uncovered somebody, what do you do with that individual? And that has probably been a weakness throughout the years. So as Aaron alluded to, I'm working with an international consortium called a Mountain Safety Info. And initially, some of you may know if you're savvy into avalanches, uh, Manuel Ginswine, who developed the idea. And the idea is to develop a database on best practices, the best evidence. It's difficult to get the best evidence since there aren't any research subjects that are willing to be buried in avalanches, but it's the best uh, evidence that we have scientifically with regard to resuscitation on what to do with these individuals once they are uncovered. Axie, next slide, please. And while she's getting the next slide, I'll just tell you that what we've developed uh, besides several algorithms for excavating individuals is this thing called an avalife flowchart. And avalife exists as a uh, type of a basic life support type of system, a first responder type of algorithm. And you can see this busy flow chart here that I actually break down in other talks. But it's like what Aaron was talking about, we basically want to determine A, if there's life-threatening injuries, because one of the things that will kill people in the backcountry after an avalanche is trauma. But the other major contributor for death is going to be asphyxiation, so basically inability to breathe, respire. And so what Aaron's talking about is basically making sure that you clear that airway. The other thing that supervenes or takes place with people who've been buried greater than an hour is hypothermia. And so what we've done is we've taken the best practices and have seen these are the three major life threats. We broke it down to a very simple algorithm. So it basically <clears throat> comprises people who might have first response levels or basic solo response, companion rescue, so if you have buddies, or if you have an organized search and rescue team, or if you are an advanced life support provider, such as a paramedic, nurse, physician. Next slide, please. And what we do is this is the way our database looks like. So basically, you've excavated the person, and once that individual's head and chest is found because that's what you're trying to focus. There's some you know, problems with that. But once you try to zero in on the head and chest, other people are still excavating while the uh, medical person, whoever that might be, attempts to resuscitate the person initially within that cave and then hopefully they are brought out and you're doing the medical assessment. Once that is done, if the person is not breathing and it's been less than 60 minutes, which is usually the time for asphyxia to kill somebody, you do five initial rescue breaths. A lot of people have said, well, you do CPR first by doing chest compressions first. But according to the latest European resuscitation guidelines of 2020, the American Heart Association hasn't come around to their new recommendations. You treat an avalanche victim much like you would a drowning victim. And so we recommend five rescue breaths. And then you can check for pulse and some of those other things, as well as checking for trauma. And it's a very busy thing which we teach a lot of our providers how to actually do and you make sure that there's no concretions you document the presence of an air pocket and what not and then you call for additional resources next slide and so this is basically who we're working with and we've been uh, teaching these Avalife courses to several groups here, uh, ranging from you know local uh, people through the Mountain Medicine Course, and, uh, International Mountain Medicine Center. There's some noise back there. 
to uh, uh, places in Nepal. And of course, we're closely ensconced with uh, Silverton Avalanche School, and we're excited. And hopefully, we can get the word out to teach any of you who are interested in some of the things that we're developing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daryl. And so just to kind of get back to the, you know, kind of, okay, so, you know, this is obviously a great program um, and available to everybody, but what do we have locally um, here in New Mexico? So a couple of different things. So, you know, at minimum, we'd recommend, you know, taking CPR and BLS classes. Those are available through UNM's Emergency Medicine Services Academy. Um, and, you know, that, you know, goes with backcountry, you know, you know, education or just being out in public and doing your civic duty and being a good citizen, being able to respond to any type of, you know, uh, emergency that might happen right next to you in the grocery store or, or something. So, you know, so those those would be great for, you know, teaching you just the basics of basic life support and CPR. You, uh, at the International Mountain Medicine Center, we offer a wilderness first aid course. And again, this is not geared specifically towards, you know, backcountry uh, recreation in the winter. Um, but it really is geared towards recreating in the wilderness and does obviously have some application to it. And that's a 16-hour online course that can be registered for through the UNM International Mountain Medicine Center. And then lastly, we've recognized this gap in specific avalanche uh, resuscitation or avalanche rescue. Um, and so um, we're currently kind of in the works to developing what we're going to call avalanche first aid, which is basically taking our wilderness first aid model and developing a program specifically towards taking those first steps uh, in an avalanche in an avalanche uh, incident to where you're focusing on the, the airway, the rescue breaths, a trauma assessment, protecting people from the environment, because even once you uncover them, it's hard to get them out if they can't get on their own and how to get them out safely. And so um, we're working on that with the Silverton Avalanche School, and hopefully we'll have more information on that uh, in the short term. But um, again, thanks everyone for logging in. Uh, thanks, Axie. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you both. Um, and please, if you have questions for the doctors, for anything that, that's going on um, at UNM, drop those in the chat and we will come back to them. But first, I want to dive in even deeper to what are those resources available at the local level. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andy Bond. And let me see if I can pull up our, our main slideshow. We were having some issues with slides getting cut off, which is why we're in this view right now. Um, but recognizing that it'd be better for everyone if we could pull this up. How does that look to our panelists? Great. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy. Andy, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Axie. Um, and thank you, Aaron and Daryl. Uh, that was awesome. And, and I can't stress it enough, the reality of our backcountry here is gonna be, especially if you are buried in an avalanche, is gonna be self-rescue. So learning those skills is, is just so important. Um, I really just wanted to talk about who we are and the resource that we can provide for New Mexicans, people skiing and riding in the backcountry. Um, like Axie said, we, we kind of we started the Avalanche Center back in 2016 as a small nonprofit. And we know that backcountry users are it's the fastest growing part of the ski industry. And so we have challenging complex terrain down here, and we kind of felt like we needed to start an avalanche center to provide a resource for people here in northern New Mexico. We work closely with the Carson National Forest Service as well as the National Weather Service in Albuquerque. All right, Axie, next slide. And so I don't mean this as a political comment, but it and some of you guys might have seen this down in Silverton when I talked there. Um, but we were kind of on an island down here. Um, I started professionally ski patrolling at Taos in 2007. And in order to get professional avalanche courses, we, we had to leave the state. Um, and so we're kind of on this isolated island where people kind of heard about Taos, Santa Fe, but there wasn't, it wasn't well connected with other avalanche centers. Um, we have limited weather stations. Uh, I would, we have avalanche courses, but I think it's pretty limited in, in our offerings compared to other places like Utah, Washington, Colorado. And we didn't have an avalanche center that communicated with the National Avalanche Center and other avalanche centers. All right, Axie, go to the next slide. And so um, if you go to our website, uh, you'll, 
and I can't think and no, oh, sorry, this is uh, the slides are a little delayed. Um, we are part of avalanche.org and we work closely with all the other avalanche centers in the West. And there's actually an avalanche center on Mount Washington, New Hampshire. Uh, there's about 13 US Forest Service avalanche centers, um, as well as Colorado, which is through the state. And then there's nine of us avalanche centers in the West that are small nonprofits. Um, so if you go to avalanche.org, this is what you'll see. Uh, some of the avalanche centers offer differing products, and I'm going to discuss that here in just a little bit. And so this year, we kind of really felt like we needed to issue danger ratings. So to issue a danger rating, we have to do a forecast every day. Uh, so this morning, I was up at four in the morning, and uh, we hope that it kind of ties us in. And I know it's a small zone. I'll talk about that and why that is in just a little bit. But hopefully, it ties New Mexico in to what other avalanche centers are doing in the West. Next slide. So if you go to our site, um, you'll notice a bunch of different stuff and resources there. Uh, the first thing is education. There's uh, great links to the Know Before You Go program. And I think John and Aaron, or sorry, Jim and Aaron are gonna talk about that here in just a sec. Um, but there's access to that as well as other online resources. Uh, we also have access to weather stuff. So if you go there, weather tools, there's uh, the National Weather Service in Albuquerque actually puts out a backcountry recreational forecast for the Taos area, uh, as well as weather tools from various models to webcams. Really, it's a, it's a plethora of information for weather. The other thing we have is observations. Um, we go out in the field a bunch and we submit our observations, but we're also relying on people when they go out to submit observations uh, through the Avalanche Center. Uh, it's a great resource, not only for us as forecasters to help with our forecast product, but it also uh, enables people to just share information. And then lastly, uh, we have the forecast product. Actually, if you go to the next slide. Um, and so we're putting these out daily at seven in the morning. Uh, we have danger ratings on them, and there's resources there as to what the danger ratings are. Um, what we found, and this research is kind of coming out of Simon Fraser up in Canada, is that some people only see colors. Um, and so when we weren't issuing danger ratings, people kind of struggled with, well, what does it mean when we're talking about persistent weak layers or avalanche conditions? So we have colors up to help people understand that as well as a bottom line uh, that kind of surmises what's happening that day in about three to four or five sentences. Um, we also produce a weather forecast product uh, for the day as well that we put out um, at the same time as the advisory. And um, hopefully you'll continue on through the advisory product. Actually, if you go to the next slide, what we're also doing is putting out the avalanche problem. And so for us, we use nine uh, symbols. Uh, this day, I believe, was persistent slab. And then we also... Um, oh, is it going to work? Sorry, what's up? Looks like someone's uh, not on mute. If everyone can mute, please. Thank you, Andy. And so then what we also do is we put out where you're most likely to encounter that avalanche problem for the day. So on, on to, uh, this forecast for that day was west, north, and east aspects near, above, um, and below tree line. And then we also put out the likelihood of a human triggered avalanche. So today or uh, the day of this forecast was likely, as well as we give the size of the avalanche, um, large being large enough to potentially bury you. Uh, and then we'll give another description. And we also continue with a, with a forecast discussion. I highly recommend it. We spend a lot of time on this every morning, about two to three hours every morning, putting this out for the public to help inform you when you're going out in the mountains to make safe, responsible decisions. Um, you can go to the next slide, Axie. And so hopefully you guys are finding this useful. Uh, we know that uh, we're not everywhere. And Aaron was able to put out a conditions blog for Santa Fe. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, um, why our zone is kind of small. We lack weather stations. Um, the Latiers don't have weather stations and uh, Santa Fe area has very limited weather stations as well as the Truchas. 
Um, we were able to put in, I believe six years ago now, uh, detailed or like about eight weather stations in the mountains here uh, around Taos. And we're relying on that information for how much snow came overnight, how much, what were the winds doing, how much water uh, was in that storm, because that's what we need to go off of in order to provide detailed avalanche forecasts. So um, the other big reason is we just lack funds uh, to have additional forecasters down in the Santa Fe um, regions. So it's just myself this year and Steve, who's coming uh, from Snow Safety at Crystal Mountain in Washington. So we're doing this every day. I, I really don't have days off. And we're, we're producing a forecast just for Taos. And we're hoping Aaron and some others can continue doing conditioned blog products for the Santa Fe area. All right, Axie, you can go to the next slide. So we're really hoping um, to be able to, to be a resource for avalanche classes. I know that there's a bunch of providers. I put Silverton up uh, just because they're presenting here in this conference, but there's other great uh, avalanche education providers. Um, please go get avalanche courses down here. It's so important. And in fact, we write our forecast for a rec level one uh, user. So it, in some ways it's like, reading an avalanche forecast without getting the avalanche education is almost like providing someone a book without learning how to read first so we're, we're really relying on people going out and getting avalanche education and then hopefully what we can provide to you is a public safety message through avalanche forecasts through weather observations we did issue an avalanche warning we had a widespread natural avalanche cycle um debris actually made it 50 feet from the trail um, going up to Williams Lake. So it doesn't just impact backcountry skiers and, and snowboarders. It's also people just hiking up to Williams Lake. And we hope to be able to be a conduit to other avalanche centers and furthering avalanche education uh, through ISSW, the International Snow Science Workshop. We're going to present a study that we've been working on there. We've got an amazing snowpack to study down here. And I think that there's a lot of great opportunities if you're interested in studying social dynamics, all that stuff. We, we kind of haven't really been on the map for that. So hopefully we can continue doing that. Next slide, Axie. Uh, lastly, a big focus for us is educating the youth. I'm actually teaching an avalanche class here tonight uh, for some kids. Um, and our big focus is educating the youth. Um, we work with high school kids, with independent study projects. Uh, last year, we got a bunch of young kids out just understanding snow. We've got amazing ski, skiers and riders here in New Mexico that like skiing the steep, deep terrain here. And I, I just think it's so important to get these kids um, the opportunity to understand why they're able to ski, even if it's in bounds, why they're able to ski steep terrain. And we know that a lot of these kids are going off to college and, and getting potentially their first um, access to the backcountry is when they go to University of Utah or UC Boulder or something like that. So we're trying to get education into the youth as much as we can because we just feel like it's so important. Uh, so with that, thank you, Axi, and thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, uh, this is great. I just want to say that bringing the community together in New Mexico, this is much needed, and I, it, it's amazing. So hopefully we can continue doing this because we do have amazing people down here. Awesome. Thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing, Andy, putting in long days from 4 a.m. to whenever tonight, teaching kids about how important this work is. So thank you for joining us. We're going to do a little bit of a rearrange of schedule. Um, Dr. Nesifer is going to wrap us up in about 15 minutes. But first, we're going to go to the Silverton Avalanche School team um, who has another presentation that they want to share about the resources that they lead. Jim, Aaron, thanks for joining us today. Great, Axie, thank you for uh, inviting us. And we just really appreciate this. Uh, my name is Jim Donovan. I'm the executive director of the Silverton Avalanche School. And I'm joined with uh, Aaron Rice, who's one of our instructors. And um, he is, uh, excuse me while I just cancel that. Um, he is, uh, Aaron, just want to do a little uh, quick spiel about yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Aaron Rice. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I'm a recreational level instructor for the Silverton Avalanche School, as well as um, a ski patroller here in Santa Fe, and have really been working hard to, to push this um, education forward by, by facilitating other means of 
of easier access for avalanche education here in, in northern New Mexico and hopefully in the future across the entire state. Excellent. And just a, uh, we're based in Silverton, Colorado, uh, but Southwest Colorado has very deep connections with New Mexico. So we are, uh, we, we have a lot of students who will come up and take avalanche courses with us. So we are really excited to start uh, working more in New Mexico and helping provide uh, some avalanche education. And I want to give a, a big shout out to Andy Bond in the Taos Avalanche Center. Uh, avalanche centers and avalanche education work hand in hand. So we really appreciate the efforts he has made um, over the years and, uh, you know, very amazing work in Taos is just an amazing area. So, um, Axie, next slide, please. And uh, just a quick shout out to our sponsors. Uh, I wanted to just mention Mammut, Vison the UNM uh, School of International Mountain Medicine, and then also the American Avalanche Association. Um, all of these uh, entities play a very big role in uh, avalanche education uh, worldwide. Next slide, please. So this is an awareness program. This, uh, we're actually using <clears throat> information here from the Know Before You Go program which can be uh, offered throughout the state. And uh, we actually did a Know Before You Go program down in Santa Fe last, um, last winter. And <clears throat> idea is just give people an, uh, an awareness level of what avalanches are. And that's the first step. Then you wanna go get more avalanche education. And you start with what's called a recreational level one course. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so basically, if you are recreating in the mountains uh, and the mountains have snow, then you need to know about avalanches. It, <clears throat> we are <coughs> agnostic on the uh, basically the um, mode that you travel. What we want to do is make sure wh whichever way you travel, whether it be ski, snowboard, mountaineering, hiking, snowshoeing, extreme uh, snow biking, snowmobiling, skiing, that we want to make sure that you're safe in that terrain. Next slide, please. So just a quick picture of where avalanche accidents happen in the U.S. You can see from here, Colorado is number one. Colorado's got a very big uh, backcountry skier community. Um, we also just have a lot of avalanches, uh, but you can see New Mexico is is in there, and that really is that um, kind of the southern uh, Rockies that gets in and a lot of avalanche terrain. Next slide, please. So um, this both uh, Dr. Riley and uh, Dr. Macias uh, mentioned this, but in avalanches, the number one way that you die is actually through asphyxia. That's basically, you're not able to <clears throat> get enough oxygen. Other ways are uh, through trauma, and avalanche is a very basically violent event, and so you can get just banged up, and then hypothermia. Snow is cold, so if you're in that snow for a long time, that's another way. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a very big and important statistic. 90% of avalanche accidents are triggered by the person caught or by someone else in the group. Avalanches, um, you really get uh, set avalanches off by, by triggering them. So <coughs> humans are, are kind of the main, um, main culprit in this. And that's why education is so important. Next slide. So what is an avalanche? Basically, it is a mass of snow on a steep slope that needs a trigger. Those are the, the basically the, the recipes. If you get enough snow on that steep slope and have a trigger, which can be a person, then you can get an, uh, an avalanche that gets started. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, so snow is very, uh, very diverse, and it is um, ranges from uh, very loose snow to um, 
very uh, very dense snow. So what we call that uh, is between basically a loose snow to a slab avalanche. And this type of snow, uh, the slab avalanches are the ones that we're always most concerned about. But it's important to know that snow has a wide range of, of um, properties to it. Next slide, please. So uh, where do avalanches occur? They occur basically anywhere where there is a steep slope and anywhere um, that you have that steep terrain. But they can also occur just off of roof. Uh, roof. So on a house uh, that builds up a lot of snow, that can actually cause an avalanche. And uh, those have been responsible for um, fatalities as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So um, one important thing to know is that uh, avalanches um, most often happen outside of ski resorts. They can happen in ski resorts, but within ski resorts, avalanches are controlled. And I know this is a very um, important subject for uh, New Mexico and the Taos area. Uh, Taos ski area is a world famous location, uh, but within that ski area, it is controlled. So the moment you, you get out of that ski area boundary, you are uh, on your own and uh, you have to understand the risk that you're taking. But with that being said, <clears throat> even in a ski area, we can never reduce risk to zero and um, accidents can happen even within a ski area. This is a shot from uh, Taos with their accident just to show how big these accidents can happen, uh, the scale of these accidents, and the number of resources that is required. And um, next slide, please. So, but Ski Patrol are out there working very hard to make sure that uh, those areas are safe. They use a wide range of tools, uh, a lot of um, <clears throat> explosives basically to artificially trigger those avalanches to reduce the risk. Next slide. So the most important thing to know in avalanche terrain is what's called the slope angle. So if it's, if it's over uh, 45 degrees, that snow is um, just gonna fall off and never form that slab that I talked about earlier. But the real hot zone is that 30 to 45 degrees. That's where snow can pile up and uh, basically uh, turn into a slab and all it needs is that trigger. It just kind of waits there for a trigger to appear. That trigger can be natural snow, natural snowfall, wind events, or people, and people is the number one. But below that 30 degrees, it's generally safe. So um, as you read the forecast and understand it, you can start to still go out in um, certain um, avalanche hazard ratings and still do it very safely. But you just really need to know how to read terrain. And that's what you learn when you take an avalanche education course. Next slide. So, oops, and uh, so within terrain, I'm just gonna, this is just like a big picture to show you how we teach you how to um, basically drape, um, how to read terrain over a mountain landscape. So you can have parts that are very steep and parts that aren't as steep, but they can still be connected to that steeper slope and you can still be affected by it. Next slide. And this shows you just the wide range of avalanches, and these are slab avalanches that can occur in all types of terrain. Next slide. So another piece that we really um, educate people on is the types of avalanche terrain that exist, and some that are called terrain traps. So we have <clears throat> on the uh, left side of the screen, we have gullies, we have uh, the lower side, rocks, cliffs, trees, and even lakes. You can get pushed into uh, a, an alpine lake 
and um, basically that's a terrain trap. So these are areas that we teach you how to read that terrain. Next slide. So <clears throat> what what can you do? Um, you know, it's it, we don't want to uh, have people be scared going out into the backcountry. If you have the knowledge, then you have the power. And uh, so what we want you to do though, is make sure that you get the training before you go out into the backcountry. Because it's very important to understand the risks, but, but also have that knowledge. So when you go out, you can make good decisions. Part of those good decisions is making sure you're reading the forecast every day before you go out. Next slide. <clears throat> So uh, what we say is get the gear, uh, get the training, and then get the forecast. Those are the big three that we really uh, push. So the gear <coughs> is really this, uh, these three pieces. It's called a transceiver, an avalanche probe, and an avalanche shovel. You carry that in a backpack, and that is, uh, those are the basic pieces of equipment along with all of your other winter equipment that you need to uh, travel safely in avalanche terrain. Next slide. There's other gear as well. Um, if you get really into it, an avalanche airbag is considered now a very, um, uh, one of the important pieces. Basically, it's got a, a airbag that inflates if you get caught in an avalanche and you rise to the top of the uh, pile of snow. And <clears throat> they're very effective, but they're also a little more on the expensive side. Um, so, the, but very, very useful. Other pieces of equipment are called the Avalon, which is basically an artificial um, uh, tube that you can wear to help breathe if you get caught in an avalanche. And then a device called RECO, which is a reflective, uh, based on uh, reflective radar technology, and it's passive. So it doesn't need a battery. It's usually attached into clothing. Uh, and then Ski Patrol have a device that they can use to uh, locate you. Next slide. So if you don't have a transceiver, a transceiver works by basically sending out a signal and then other people in your group turn their transceiver to pick up that signal. If you don't have that transceiver, it can be very difficult to locate you. So that's why it is so important to wear a transceiver. Uh, ski patrol, uh, if they're in avalanche terrain, they wear a transceiver. The moment <clears throat> they uh, get, um, get to the ski area to the time that they leave the parking lot. So a transceiver is really, really important. Next slide. So uh, Andy had mentioned this earlier that um, Silverton Avalanche School does offer courses. We offer courses uh, mostly in Colorado, but on the professional side, we offer them throughout the West. But there are a lot of, of education providers out there. So we really emphasize that is it important just to get into that class and make sure that you do get that basic training. So you start out with an awareness than a recreational level one. Those are the two important ones. And now there is a new course called a one day avalanche rescue. And those, um, those two together, the avalanche rescue and the, and the three day recreational avalanche course can set you up for a lifetime of uh, safely enjoying the backcountry. And if you go to avalanche.org, uh, then that will link to um, uh, education organizations all over the U.S. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So when we go out into the backcountry, every day we go out, there's just some rituals that we do. And uh, next slide. So those rituals are we get that forecast, get the picture, uh, make sure we have all the gear, and then uh, follow our plan and uh, make sure that forecast, you go to the um, Avalanche Center and the Taos Avalanche Center has a great uh, graphic display and shows the uh, different avalanche danger ratings. So that's extremely important. Okay, next slide. <coughs> 
And this is called the danger scale, and it's uh, really based on both colors, icons, and text. And the, <clears throat> the color scales go from low hazard in the green up to extreme hazard. And um, where most accidents actually happen are in that moderate or considerable hazard. So it's very important to understand all of these pieces. Extreme hazard is, is such bad weather that you don't even really want to leave your, um, go out the door. But it is really important just to read the text and um, understand uh, the implications of each, each portion of the danger scale. Next slide. And um, so if you are, um, what's very important is to know that if you're going out, you want to be as safe as possible and make sure that you're not getting yourself in trouble. Because if you get it yourself in trouble, it actually creates a cascade where you have a lot of people who are going to come in and help you. And then that's actually putting them at risk as well. So <clears throat> that's why we really instill this, um, this importance of the education and understanding how to use that knowledge and make sure that when you're going out, you're being safe. Next slide. So if you want the goods, uh, know before you go. And next slide. And next slide. So you get the gear, whoop, get the training, get the forecast, uh, and then stay out of harm's way. So those are the those are the big ones. And uh, make sure that you are checking that that forecast at Taos. And I think Taos probably uh, lists uh, AVI courses that are available in um, in the New Mexico area as well. And with that, uh, Aaron, did you want to chime in with anything? No, that was perfect. Thank you all so much for uh, for being here, and thank you, Jim, for for walking us through that. No, before you go, programming. It's the best Great. place to start. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Jim, Aaron, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Nessifer, but we're going to do a little bit of a costume change. So bear with me while I pull up a new set of slides. Um, and, you know, in this minute while I do it, we have gotten some good questions. So as I do that, I'm going to throw a few of those out to our awesome panelists. Uh, one that comes up top of the screen, I believe is for, for you, Andy. This is coming from someone who looks like they did some some backcountry skiing or riding in the Chama area. If they want to go backcountry kind of beyond in New Mexico, beyond where you guys are forecasting, what should they do before they do that? What other resources are there in addition to all the ones we've talked about this morning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's difficult. I think the Chama area, um, there go to Mezzo West. Uh, there's a um, you can link to all the snowtail and weather station sites. Um, so I'd highly recommend that to be able to at least get an idea of how much snow wind is going on there, um, as well as the CIC in Colorado, um, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center uh, forecasts uh, stop at the Southern San Juans. But between my forecast and the South San Juan forecast in Colorado. You should have a pretty good idea of, of what's going on. Other than that, it's 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 kind of difficult and getting the education and having to assess terrain and snowpack conditions as you go out there is really what you're gonna have to do because um, information is limited out there. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. You know, one more resources question, uh, probably for, for Daryl and Aaron Riley. Um, where can people find more information about these great UNM programs that you all have outlined? How do they best participate? And so um, as far as finding the courses, uh, really just a Google search for either University of New Mexico Interna International Mountain Medicine Center. You can pretty much link to anything from that. Um, that's where the wilderness first aid courses will be um, and where you can get, you know, if you have more specific things, you can contact the, uh, the faculty at the Mountain Medicine Center to ask questions and uh, more details. Um, the University of New Mexico Emergency Services Academy um, is, uh, again, all this can be linked through the our new fancy UNM uh, website um, that uh, they spent a little while developing, but uh, uh, just pull it up, the uh, Emergency Medicine Services Academy, or EMSA, EMSA, um, and you can link to the uh, the Bat Cave courses, which are CPR, BLS, 
um, and even you know other other kind of uh, courses that are available to to the public. So those are the best places to kind of get set up. But like I said, if you link to the IMMC website, the UNM IMMC website, um, there's a link to just ask us questions or get information and things along those lines. So that's the best spot. And you can awesome. contact us as well uh, with regard to some of the more national uh, courses, or even if you're into the international courses. And we often teach up at Silverton at the uh, Mountain Medicine Symposium. So Jim's a great resource for that. 100%. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I want to share my screen again and have Dr. Nessifer close us out of what's been a really awesome, informative presentation, um, and it's going to continue to be so. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Nessifer. Here we are um, with your slides, and let's just make sure that everyone can see it. Thumbs up, and we are good to go. We're going to bring him back on muting issues as as is the case with 2020, right? Okay, as I bring him on back on, I'm going to ask, what, ask one more question kind of as we have this pulled up. This one was probably best for Silverton Avalanche School, Jim and, and Aaron. You, you listed all that gear. Um, but often that gear can be so prohibitively expensive, kind of even the basics. Like, do you have some advice on on how one goes about finding the best value while also still making decisions that are ultimately about safety? Yes, that is a uh, excellent question, and I would say um, the all of the manufacturers do try to make basically a um, recreational transceiver model and then it kind of goes in in more advanced phases um, so just try to you know there's many resources now to find good deals but what you really need to do is find a uh, transceiver that has three antennas and do not you know this is a life safety piece of equipment so you don't want to um, kind of shortchange yourself you want to make sure that you are getting a very good uh, piece of equipment so remember three antennas on that beacon and that will basically mean it's a modern uh, modern beacon but otherwise just look around on the on on the web and uh, uh, contact your local gear stores um, and try to find the the best model that'll fit uh, fit your needs then the other gear is is really actually affordable. The Avalanche Pro uh, shovels, you know, you can often buy these as packages as well. So that's what I would suggest. Aaron, yeah. did you want to? Yeah, just to chime in on that, um, I'm often approached by people who are on, uh, you know, brand new setups, skis, snowboards, and otherwise that might cost a couple thousand dollars, and um, and then ask about the expense of of a beacon shovel probe kit that will cost a third of that. And I acknowledge that it's very expensive, but um, just deciding where to spend that money. If you are planning on getting into the backcountry, I'd suggest selling that brand new gear, buying yourself a a three hundred dollar entry package um, for a beacon shovel probe, and then. Um, yeah, just just setting those priorities for for personal safety. I also carry a small um, ten dollar slope meter, and as Jim talked about in his presentation, that's really the most important thing when it comes to triggering avalanches is recognizing the terrain and recognizing when you're in a dangerous slope. Um, I keep that right in my pocket, and that small piece of equipment, uh, very inexpensive, is is probably the piece of equipment I use the most. One other follow-up question that I see there, like is there any, how do people educate themselves about where to even begin to purchase some of these products? I know there's obviously, um, you know, international, national media, but anything else that folks can look to in terms of that just like basic, you know, gear 101 reading that they should be doing? What are you all using? 
Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, I think it's good whether you're a, a backcountry skier, a snowmobiler, um, any type of outdoor recreation is go to a, a local um, equipment shop. They will often have, uh, you know, you, you can at least find out where they will have the um, backcountry um, gear. And that's a great place to start because you can talk with someone, you can actually see the equipment and um and and look at it and um i highly recommend that because it, it gives you just a way to to see what it all looks like how it's all packaged together and then there are several manufacturers um who uh make the equipment we um you know mammut is a very high quality um one of the best especially for professional rescuers uh, but we also recommend really any equipment uh, manufacturer that meets the the standards. Um, so backcountry access is really good. Black Diamond also produces a lot of avalanche equipment. So I just recommend uh, finding the gear though that you like and you can try, and uh, that's the best approach. Great, thank you, Jim. And I do want to apologize for some technical difficulties, but we have pulled up the. <laughs> The slides of Dr. Nessifer, and I want to make sure he gets a good um, 15 minutes to present as well, because this is really crucial information, and we're really honored to have him here today. So kind of in the, the honorary spot of closing us out for the day, um, I want to hand it over to you, Dr. Nessifer. Thanks for being here today. Great. And you'll be driving the slides, it looks like. So I will um, drive the slides, so just shout. Great. Um, awesome, everyone. Um, really excited to be here. I actually grew up in northern New Mexico, and my first time skiing was at Sipapu and eventually Taos. And um, I uh, eventually I went to college outside the state, and um, but I still come back every winter. So it's a place that still is just uh, so meaningful for me, and you know, family and friends are still there. So um, I'm a professor at the University of Arizona of American Indian Studies and the Utah Center for Public Policy. I do a lot around environmental risk perception. Um, so a lot of that risk research that you learn about heuristics, I did a lot of that work in, in grad school. Um, uh, but my sort of path into um, snow and skiing and backcountry skiing and eventually ski mountaineering was a pretty long one. Um, I actually didn't learn to ski until about five years ago. I was self-taught. Um, and in large part, it was just because of the opportunities as a young man growing up in New Mexico in a native community where we didn't have the resources just really compounded the challenges that were there. Um, I moved to Colorado um, and really just fell in love with the mountains and just saw this as just an opportunity for storytelling. So this was a this was a short story that we did um, with Four Shearer, who's a Patagonia snowboarder. You can read about it in the cleanest line. But this was us skiing off of um, uh, Dokoa Slead, which is known as the San Francisco Peaks, and um, we got. We sure got hammered that day, but um, what was particularly notable about this is it was a majority indigenous crew, um, all ARI certified. It was expensive. It took a long time, but we um, got up to our ARI 2 certification, so we were really excited about that. Um, next slide. So when I, you know, I think in broader context, when we, I have to just couch this into the broader context around um, American Indian uh, educational achievement and this thing known as the achievement gap. Um, you know, the, the stats are pretty shocking. I mean, in many ways, I'm an anomaly um, having a doctorate given these contexts. And, and when we look at um, uh, the path for education for Amer many American Indian students and American Indian communities, um, it's one that's it's, it's fraught. And it also has a long history of, of education being used as a tool of colonization. Um, and there's a lot of other um, elements that play into this gap as well, related to poverty, related to inequalities and in access. Um, these sort of other factors outside of the classroom can really determine success within the classroom. And it's important that we look at these as well. Next slide. Um, so, you know, one of the things is that, you know, if we look at how do we address this opportunity gap? Um, you know, one of these is, you know, we can't, can do, we it basically, we have to lean on um, larger policies. Um, whether that's reducing inequality um, and addressing other sorts of opportunity gaps around education, and then just basically ensuring that folks, students coming in the classroom are um, having their basic needs met, which goes a long way. Um, and the other is, I think, within the SNOW community and something that we've been work really working on is just increasing awareness of where Indigenous communities and Native peoples are coming from. And I'll actually be telling a short story about Connor pictured here. 
um, in, in sort of highlighting that. Next slide. So the, the next I really see as an opportunity and where we've been working is just investing in a cohort of indigenous avalanche educators, education, and these support systems around that. So our first step is just, we have our athletes, we have our folks that know how to ski, that know how to do the mountaineering stuff and um, know how to get down safely. Um, and that's simply the first step. The next is starting to look at things like, how do you create culturally relevant education? And I'll give an example of what that could look like. Um, but also what are these support systems and these elements that are unique to avalanche education? And obviously gear is a big piece of that. You have those thousand dollar sticks under your feet and you know all of the other stuff um, attached to you. And those simply become more and more barriers, but I don't think that those should be barriers to allowing folks to enjoy the mountains and, and the winter landscapes that we all recreate in. Um, and I really think that there's a huge opportunity to begin thinking about um, developing this education, these cohort models in conjunction with tribal colleges within the state. So within the state of New Mexico, um, there's Navajo Technical University and Diné College. And I think there's there's some opportunities there to um, think about this as, as, a, as a career pipeline and an opportunity for Native communities to become embedded into these, um, to these industries. Next slide. So one of the ones that I, I always like to fall back on is uh, the New Oxford Dictionary is a picture dictionary that we use in school. One of the things that I was really bummed out about when I was in school is that they didn't have any um, uh, pictures or, or sort of explanations of the features of the mountains in Navajo. And that's almost just like a low hanging fruit. Um, you know, I think if, if young Navajo students are able to see um, words associated with different features of the mountains and, you know, maybe snowpacks, then it can become much more of a relatable um, activity in a relatable environment. Um, so anyways, it's a little project that came up in, in making this uh, that I'm excited to take a dive into. Next slide. So um, I'll just give you a short story about the, the two men that I'll talk about here. Um, Connor and um, Connor's Hunk Papa Lakota grew up um, in Colorado and the second man you'll see is is Aaron Mike. He's Navajo. Um, you know in many ways our connection to mountains is a one that's embedded in long um, cultural traditions and so for us we try to meld um, our ceremonial practices with our backcountry skiing. Um, anything that sort of tilts the odds in our favor that we get out safely in addition to our education is definitely something we want to do. So here we're placing an offer and this is um, uh, the La in the La Plata Mountains this past May. Um, granted, we didn't have to worry about much because the snowpack was pretty stable. So just as long as we were off before 3 p.m. we were pretty good. Next slide. So Aaron and Connor, you know, in many ways are um, the anomalies. It really was a combination of you know, Connor was already skiing. Um, Aaron just learned three years ago, and part of the gap was just providing the equipment. Um, you know, he already had the stoke and the interest to take it further. Um, but we we really saw the importance at an early age. You know, basically from their first time out, began this conversation about talking about snow safety and being safe in the mountains, and that was very key. Having gone through this education myself, and also getting in an avalanche on my third time out after my first edge avi course, that really nailed it in my head. Um, and, uh, of, you know, at least in bringing safety as a, a critical part of this uh, education. So this past May, we decided to finish the last of the, skiing the four sacred Navajo peaks. This is um, uh, one of the really nice uh, spring spring bowls that um, just corns up really nice. Um, so we're on our way up. Uh, next slide. So three years ago, I never imagined I would um, be taking these Looney Tunes up a Kular, but um, you know, they were into it and we, you know, having talked about safety, having done our wilderness first aid and having done all these requisite course, we really saw, saw it as a huge gap. But, you know, at the end of the day, I was, I was basically investing a few thousand dollars in each of these individuals in their education. Next slide. But at the end of the day, one of the things that we just really wanted to highlight is that, you know, images like these are, um, inspiring, and especially for many young Native men in our communities, this this has an immeasurable effect in terms of what we think is capable of our own community members and what's possible. Next slide. And I'm going to share Aaron's. Uh, we were we were both pretty scared. We slide slipped a good chunk <laughs> of those first hundred feet off the lip. But you know, one of the things is that. Um, 
we, you know, one of the pieces that I think has been really valuable about going through avalanche education, mountain safety, is that we're, we, we learn important and valuable tools of communication and um, talking about how we're feeling about this moment and about the risk and about, you know, sort of our state of being. And in many ways, that's therapeutic for ourselves. Um, you know, we come from communities in which there's a lot of trauma and a lot of, of reasons not to trust other people and strangers, and especially going in the backcountry as a team, you have to work together, you have to trust each other, and you have to be willing to communicate. And I really have seen this transform the lives of these two men that have gone through a lot of challenges in their own personal life. Next slide. Oh, I think we're done. Uh, and that's the wonderful Kular that we booted up. We basically went into this big Alpine Basin, and we said, hey, we want to see the gnarliest thing there, and we did that, and it was scary. <laughs> but I think this was the culmination, you know, in, in our, you know, having started working with these guys for the past three years, just to see their um, professional development, where they're headed, um, but also their their development as, as people and how they've transformed um, has been amazing. And I think that's one of the, one of the inspiring things that I take away about the mountain landscapes and what they can provide. Um, and just wonderfully enough, um, actually, Connor is going to be a uh, sponsored skier by Solomon starting this season. So that's that's huge, um, and he, it's well deserved. And you know, he's he's doing you know basically his life's work at the end of the day. And so I really see this as a simply the next step is is thinking about how do we solidify this and allow for folks coming after us to also have these opportunities and enjoy it as well. So thank you so much. Awesome. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, really amazing photos too, Dr. Nessifer. So thank you for walking us through that story. Appreciate it. You know, I want to be respectful of all your time as our experts and panelists. So we will wrap it up there, uh, even though there are a few questions waiting in the wings. So I might direct those to individuals when we're done here. And then I also want to thank everyone who's joined us today. I'll be following up with both the recording and then we can share some presentations for, for everyone who, for all of our experts who are okay with that um, and make sure that, that people who are listening in kind of know where to be pointed to all the amazing resources and stories we've heard about from, um, from our experts today. So just want to give you all a big round of applause again. Thank you all so much for, for joining us and, and thank you to the the several hundred people who tuned in today to listen to this great message um, of how much New Mexico has to offer. So thank you again. We've gone up with those resources. Take care, stay safe, and happy holidays. <laughs>